up to eleven, nearly four o'clock. There is the beginning of day in the night sky, not yet the pale light of dawn, but night is certainly losing its darkness. A cockerel sounds his morning call and tells me what I already know, but what I do not want to believe, that morning will break, and soon. Morning at home used to be walking with Charlie to school, wading through piles of autumn leaves and stamping the ice in the puddles, or the three of us coming through the woods after a night's poaching on the Colonel's River and crouching down to watch a badger that didn't know that we were there. Morning here has always been to wake with the same dread in the pit of my stomach, knowing that I will have to look death in the face again, and that up to now it may have been someone else's death, but that today it could be mine, that this may be my last sunrise, my last day on this earth. All that is different now about this morning is that I know whose death it will be, and I know how it will happen. Looking at it that way, it seems not so bad. So look at it that way, Tommer. Look at it that way. I always imagined I'd be lost without Charlie at my side, and the truth is that I might have been had it not been for this new batch of re recruits that joined us straight from home, and how we needed them. Almost half of us were missing by this time, killed or wounded or sick. Those of us that were left were to them battle-hardened soldiers, old lags who had seen it all, and therefore we were to be admired, respected and even a little bit feared. Young though I still felt, I don't think that I looked it, not any more. Pete and Nipper Martin and I were old soldiers now and we behaved like it too. Alternatively reassuring the new recruits or terrifying them with our stories, befriending them or teasing them. I think we rather played up to the role they gave us and we revelled in it too, particularly Pete, who was more inventive with his stories than Nipper and me. All this gave me less time to dwell on my own fears. I was far too busy pretending I was somebody else. For some time, life was about as quiet as it could get in the front line. We and Fritz did little more than irritate each other with the occasional whiz-bangs and night patrols. And in the close confinement of the dugout and the trenches, even Sergeant Hanley could do little to make our lives any more of a misery than we already were, though he still did his very best with an endless succession of inspections and consequent punishments. But for days on end, the guns stayed silent. The spring, sh the spring sun shot, warming our backs and drying out the mud. And best of all, we went to bed dry. A rare treat, a miraculous treat. Yet, yeah, the rats were still there, and the lice loved us as much as ever, but this was a picnic compared to what we'd been through already. By now, I think the new recruits were all beginning to think that we old hags had been exaggerating with some of our harsher tales of trench warfare. Boredom and Sergeant Hanley seemed to them to be the worst they had to endure so far. And it was certainly true, particularly in Pete's case, that we had laid it on a little bit thick. But Pete, like the rest of us, had, for the most part anyway, told them stories that had at least some connection with the truth. None of us, not even Pete, could have imagined or invented what would happen to us on one of the quietest mornings in May, when we were all least expecting it. Stand two on the fire step at dawn had been normal. By now it was a mere routine for us, and it was an annoying one too. Attacks came mostly at dawn, we knew that, but after all this time we expected nothing to happen, and nothing had happened, not for a long while now anyway. We were lulled by the blue skies perhaps, or maybe by sheer boredom. Fritz seemed to have gone to sleep on us, and as far as we were concerned, that suited us just fine. We thought we could go to sleep too. The awakening came very suddenly. I was in the dugout, and I was just beginning a letter home. I am writing to my mother. I haven't written for a while, and I am feeling guilty about it. My pencil keeps breaking, and I am sharpening it again. Everyone else is lying asleep in the sun, or is sitting about, smoking and chatting. Nipper Martin is cleaning his rifle again. He's always very particular about that. Gas! Gas! The cry goes up, and is echoed all along the trench. For a moment we are frozen with panic. We have trained for this time and again, but nonetheless we fumble clumsily, feverishly with our gas masks. Fix bayonets! Hanley's yelling while we're still trying to frantically pull on our gas masks. We grab our rifles and we fix our bayonets. We're on the fire step, looking out into no man's land, and we see it rolling slowly towards us. This dreaded killer cloud we have heard so much about, but have never seen for ourselves until now. 
its deadly tendrils are searching ahead, feeling their way forward in young, long yellow wisps, scenting me and searching for me. Then finding me out, the gas turns and it drifts straight for me. I'm shouting inside my gas mask. Still, the gas comes on, wafting over our wire, through our wire, and swallowing up everything in its path. I hear again in my head the instructor's voice. I see him shouting at me through his mask when we went out on our last exercise. You're panicking in there, peaceful. A gas mask is like Godson. It'll work miracles for you, but you've got to believe in it. But I don't believe in it. I don't believe in miracles. The gas is only feet away now. In a moment it will be on me, it will be around me, and it will be in me. I crouch down, hiding my face between my knees, my hands over my helmet, praying that it will float over my head, over the top of the trench, and it will seek out someone else. But it does not. It is all around me. I tell myself that I will not breathe, that I must not breathe. Through a yellow mist, I see the trench filling up with it. It drifts into the dugouts, snaking into every nook and cranny, still looking for me. It wants to seek us all out, to kill all of us, every single one. Still... I do not breathe. I see men running, staggering, and then falling. I hear Pete shouting out for me. Then he's grabbing me, and we run. I have to breathe now. I cannot run without breathing. Half blinded by my mask, I trip and I fall, crashing my head against the trench wall, and knocking myself half senseless. My gas mask has to come off. I pull it down, but I've breathed in, and I already know that it is too late. My eyes are stinging, my lungs are burning, I am coughing, retching, and I am choking. I don't care where I'm running, so long as it is away from this gas. At last, I'm in the reserve trench, and it is clear of gas. I'm out of it. I wrench off my mask, gasping for good air. Then I'm on my hands and knees, and I vomit violently. When at last the worst of it is over, I look up through blurred and weeping eyes. A hun in a gas mask is standing over me, his rifle aimed at my head. I have no rifle. It is the end. I brace myself, but he does not fire. He lowers his rifle slowly. Go, boy, he says, waving me away with his rifle. Go, Tommy, go. So by the whim of some kind and unknown Fritz, I survived and I escaped. Later, back at our field hospital, I heard that we had counterattacked and we had driven the Germans back and retaken our frontline trenches. But from what I could see all around me, it was at an incredibly terrible cost. I lined up with the rest of the walking wounded to see the doctor. He washed out my eyes, examined them, and then he listened to my chest. Despite all of my coughing, he pronounced me fit. You're lucky. You can only have got a whiff of it, he said. As I walked away, I passed the others, those that had not been quite so lucky. They were lying stretched out in the sun, many of them faces I knew, and I would never see them again. Friends I had lived with, joked with, played cards with, and fought with. I looked for Pete amongst them. He was not there. But Nipper Martin was. He was the last body I came to. He lay there so still. There was a green grasshopper on his trousers. When I got back to rest camp that evening, I found Pete alone in the tent. He looked up at me, wide-eyed, as if he had just seen a ghost. When I told him about Nipper Martin, he was as near to tears as I'd ever seen him before. We exchanged our escape scores. We exchanged our escape stories over a mug of hot, sweet tea. When the gas attack came, Pete had run like me, like most of us, but with some of the others, he had then regrouped in the reserve trench and been part of the counter-attack. We're still here, Tomo. We're alive, he said, and that's all that matters, I suppose. Unfortunately, so is horrible Andy, but at least I've got some good news for you. He waved a couple of letters at me. You've got two of them, you lucky devil. No one back home writes to me. Hardly surprising, I suppose. But they can't write, can they? Well, my sister can, but we don't speak. Not anymore. Tell you what, Tommy. You can read yours out to me, and then I can pretend that they're writing to me as well, can't I? Go on, Tommy. I'm listening. He lays back, puts his hand under his head, and closed his eyes. He didn't leave me much choice, really, did he? I have them with me now. My very last letters from home. I tried to keep all the others, but some got lost, and others were often so soaked through, that they became unreadable, and I had to throw them away. But these I've looked after with the greatest of care, because everyone I love is in them. 
I keep them in a waxed, sorry, I keep them in waxed paper in my pocket, close to my heart. I've read them over and over again, and each time I can hear their voices in their words, I can see their faces in their writing. I'll read them aloud again just now, just as I read them to Pete that very first time in the tent. I'll read Mother's letter first, because that's the one that I read first. My dear son, I hope this letter finds you in good health. I have such good news to tell you. Last Monday, in the early morning, Molly gave birth to a little boy. As you can imagine, we are all delighted at the happy event. You can imagine also our surprise and joy when I answered a knock at the door less than a week ago to find your brother, Charlie, standing in the porch. He looks thinner than I remember him, and much older too. I do not think he has been eating enough, and I have told him he must do so in the future. He says that in spite of everything we read in the papers here, you have been having a fine time together over in Belgium. Everyone I meet in the village asks how you are, even your great aunt. She was the first to come and see the baby. She said that although he was handsome, she thought he had rather pointed ears, which is untrue, of course, and it upset Molly greatly. Why does she always have to say such hurtful things? As for the colonel, if we are to believe all he says, he could win this war all by himself. Your father was so right about him. Much has changed in the village, and none of it for the better. More of our young men go to join up all the time. There are scarcely enough men left to work the land. Hedges go untrimmed, and many fields lie fallow. Sad to say, Fred and Margaret Darsons had news only last month that Jimmy will not be coming home. It seems he died of his wounds in France. But Charlie's short visit and the birth of the baby have cheered us all. Charlie tells us that very soon there will be another big push, and then the war will be won and over with. We pray that he is right. Dear son, even with Charlie home, with Big Joe and Molly and the new baby... This little house seems empty because you are not with us. Come home safe and come home soon. Your loving mother. And Big Joe's inky thumbprint was smeared along the bottom of the page as usual, with his name beside it in huge spidery lettering. So that's what we're having, is it? Said Pete suddenly and angrily. A fine time. What does he tell them that for? Why doesn't he tell them what it's really like out here? What a hopeless mess it all is. How there's good men, thousands of them, dying for nothing. For nothing! I'll tell him. Give me half a chance and I'll tell him. Saying things like that, Charlie should be ashamed of himself. Those men who died today, were they having a fine time? Were they? I'd never seen Pete this angry before. He was always the joker, the wag, and always playing the fool. He rolled over on his side with his back to me, and he didn't speak again. So I read the next letter to myself. It was from Charlie. Mostly, anyway. Unlike Mother, he'd made lots of mistakes and crossings out, so his letter was much harder to read. Dear Private Peaceful, I am home again, as you can see, Tomo. Better late than never, as they say. I am the proud father, and you are the proud uncle of the finest-looking little fellow you ever saw. I wish you could see him, but you will, and soon, I hope. Molly tells me he is even more handsome than his father, which I'm very sure is not true. Big Joe sits over him while he sleeps, like he used to with Bertha. He worries I shall go off again soon, which of course I shall. He does not understand. How could he? Where we have been, or what we have been doing. And I'd rather not tell him. I'd rather not tell anyone. After I came out of hospital, I managed to wangle only three days' leave, of which I now have only one day left. I shall make the best use of it. Lastly, you should know that we have all decided the little fellow will be called Tommo. Each time we say his name, it makes me think you are here with us, as we all wish you were. Molly has said that she wants to write a few words also, so I shall end now. Chin up, your brother Charlie, or the other private peaceful. Dear Tomo, I wrote to say that I have told little Tomo all about his brave uncle, about how one day, when this dreadful war is over, we shall all be together again. He has your blue eyes, Charlie's dark hair, and he has Big Joe's great grin. Because of all this, I love him more than I can say. Your Molly. Those two letters I kept by me and read and reread till I knew them almost by heart. They kept me going during the days ahead. I took from them the hope of Charlie's return and the strength that I needed to stop myself from going entirely mad. We might have thought, we certainly hoped, that Sergeant Hanley would let up a... Blah, 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 blah would let up on us now and let us rest before going back up into the line. 
but we were to discover that we should have known already. We were to discover what we should have known already, that this wasn't in his nature. He said we had shamed the regiment, that we had behaved like a bunch of cowards when the gas attack came, that if it was the last thing he did, he would put backbone into us. So Hanley kept at us morning, noon and night, day in, day out. Inspections, training, drilling, exercising, more inspections. He drove us he, he drove us mercilessly, drove us all to despair and to exhaustion. Caught sleeping one night at his post, Ben Guy, the innkeeper's son from Exbourne, one of the new recruits, was subjected, as Charlie had been before him, to field punishment number one. For day after day, he was strapped there on the gunwheel in all weathers. As with Charlie at Eatables, we were forbidden even to speak to him or to take him water. These were the darkest days that we had ever lived through. Sergeant Hanley had done what all the bloody attrition in the trenches had never managed to do. He had taken away our spirit and he had drained the last of our strength. He had destroyed our hope. More than once, as I lay there in my tent at night, I thought of deserting or running to Anna in Pop and asking her to hide me, to help me find a way back to England. But when morning came, even my courage to be a coward had evaporated. I stayed each time because I was too cowardly to go, because I yeah, because I couldn't abandon Pete and the others and not be there when Charlie got back. And I stayed, too, because Molly had said I was brave and mentioned... Oh, rubbish that. Sorry. And I stayed, too, because Molly had said I was brave and had named little Tomo after me. I couldn't shame her and I couldn't shame him. Much to our surprise, we were granted one night of freedom before we were sent off up into the line again and we all headed straight into pop. Most of us were going for the beer and food, and I longed for all that as well. But as we walked into the town, I realised I had Anna on my mind a lot more than I had egg and chips. But Anna did not bring us beers. Another girl did. A girl that none of us had seen before. I looked around me, but I could not see Anna, serving at any of the other tables either. When the girl bought us our egg and chips, I asked her where Anna was. She just shrugged as if she didn't understand, but there was something about her that told me she did understand that she did know, but would not tell me. Thanks to Pete and Charlie, my liking for Anna had not been a secret in the company for some time now, and now everyone was teasing me mercilessly as I looked around for her. Tiring of it, I left their mocking laughter behind me and went outside to look for her. I looked first in the stable, where she'd taken me before, but it was empty. I walked down the darkening farm track, past the hen houses, to see if the horse might be out in the field and Anna there with him. There were a couple of bleating, tethered goats, but I could see no horse and no Anna. Only then did I think of going back and knocking on the back door. I screwed my courage up. I had to knock loudly to be heard because of all the noise coming from within. The door opened slowly, and there was her father. Not dapper and smiling as I'd always known him, but in his braces and shirt, unshaven and dishevelled. He had a bottle in his hand, and his face was heavy with drink. He was not pleased to see me. Anna? I said. Is Anna in? No, he replied. Anna isn't in. Anna will never be in again. Anna is dead. You hear this, Tommy? You come here and you fight your war in my place. Why? Tell me this. Why? What happened? I asked him. What happened? I tell you what happened. Two days ago, I sent Anna to fetch the eggs. She is driving the cart home along the road and a shell comes. Only one. But one is enough. I bury her today. So if you want to see my anatomy, then you go to the graveyard. Then you can go to hell. All of you. British, German, French. You think I care? And you think you can take your war to hell with you? They will like it there. Leave me alone, Tommy. Leave me alone. The door was slammed shut in my face. There were several recently dug graves in the churchyard but I found only one that was freshly dug and covered with fresh flowers. I had known Anna only from a few laughing words, from the light in her eyes, from a touch of her hands and from a fleeting kiss. But I felt an ache inside me, such as I had not felt since I was a child, since my father's death. I looked up at the church steeple, a dark arrow pointing at the moon and beyond, and tried with all my heart and mind to believe she was up there somewhere, in that vast expanse of infinity. Up there in Sunday school heaven, in Big Joe's happy heaven. I couldn't bring myself to think it. 
I knew that she was lying in this cold earth at my feet. I knelt down and I kissed the earth. Then I left her there. The moon sailed above me, following behind me, through the trees, lighting my way back to camp. By the time I got there, I had no more tears left to cry. The next night we were marching up into the trenches, again, along with hundreds of others, to stiffen the line, they told us. That could only mean one thing. An attack was expected, and we would be in for a packet of trouble. As it turned out, Fritz was to give us a couple of days' grace. No attack came, not just yet. Charlie came instead. He just strolled into our dugout as if he'd been gone five minutes. Afternoon, Tomo. Afternoon, all. He said, grinning from ear to ear. His arrival gave us all brand new heart. With Sergeant Hanley still on our backs, always on the prowl, we had our champion back. The only one of us who had ever faced him down. As for me, I had my guardian back, my brother and my best friend. Like everyone else, I felt suddenly safer. I was there when Sergeant Hanley and Charlie came face to face in the trench. What a nice surprise, Sergeant, Charlie chirped. I heard you'd joined us. And I heard you'd been malingering. Peaceful, Hanley snarled. I don't like malingerers. I've got my eye on you, Peaceful. You're a troublemaker. Always have been. I am warning you. One step out of line. Don't you worry yourself, Sergeant, said Charlie. I'll be good as gold. Cross my heart. The sergeant looked first nonplussed, then explosive. Nice weather we're having, sergeant, Charlie went on. It's rain and in blighter, you know. Cats and dogs. Hanley pushed past him, muttering to himself as he went. It was a little enough victory, but it cheered all of us who witnessed it to the bottom of our hearts. That evening, Charlie and I sat drinking our tea over a guttering lamp and talked quietly for the first time. I was full of questions about everyone at home, but he seemed unwilling to say very much about them. I was taken aback by this. I was a little bit hurt even, until he saw I was, and he explained why. It's like we live in two separate lives, in two separate worlds, Tomo, and I want to keep it that way. I never want the one to touch the other. I didn't want to bring horrible Hanley and the whiz-bangs and stuff back home, did I? And for me, it's the same the other way round. Home's home, ears ear. It's difficult to explain, but little Tomo and Molly, mother and Big Joe, they don't belong in this hello of a place, do they? By talking about them, I bring them here, and I don't want to do that. You understand, Tomo? And I did. We hear the shell coming and know from the shriek of it that it will be close. And it is. The blast of it throws us all to the ground, putting our lamps, putting out lamps and plunging us into the pungent darkness. It is, it is the very first shell of thousands. Our guns answer almost at once, and from then on, the titanic duel is almost constant as the world above us erupts, the roar and thunder pounding us remorselessly, all day, all night. When the guns do let up, it is all the more cruel, for it gives us some fragile hope that it might at last be over, only to snatch that hope away again mere minutes later. To begin with, we huddle together in the dugout and try to pretend to ourselves that it isn't happening, and even if it is, that our dugout is deep enough to see us through. We all know in our heart of hearts that a direct hit will be the very end of all of us. We know it and we accept it. We just prefer not to think about it, and certainly not to talk about it. We drink our tea, we smoke our woodbines, we eat food when it comes, which isn't very often, and we go on living as best we can, as normally as we can. It doesn't seem very possible, but on the second day, the bombardment intensifies. Every heavy gun the Germans have seems to be aimed at our sector. There is a moment when the last fragile vestiges of controlled fear give way to terror, a terror that can be hidden no longer. I find myself curled into a ball on the ground and screaming for it to stop. Then I can feel Charlie lying beside me, folding himself around me to protect me, to comfort me. He begins to sing, Oranges and lemons, softly in my ear, and soon I am singing with him, and loudly too, singing instead of screaming. Screaming. Instead of screaming. Before we know it, the whole dugout is singing along with us, but the barrage goes on and on, until in the end neither Charlie nor oranges and lemons can drive away the terror that is engulfing me and invading me, destroying any last glimmer of courage and composure that I may have left. All I have now is my fear. When their attack comes in the pearly light of dawn, it falters before it even gets near our wire. 
Our machine gun is see to that, knocking them down like thousands of grey skittles, never to rise again. My hands are shaking so much that I can hardly reload my rifle. When they recoil and turn and run, we wait for the whistle, and then we go out over the top. I go, because the others go, moving forward as if in a trance, as if outside myself altogether. I find myself suddenly on my knees, and I don't know why. There is blood pouring down my face, and my head is racked with a sudden burning pain so terrible that I feel it must burst. I feel myself falling out of my dream down into a world of swirling darkness. I am being beckoned into a world I have never been to before, where it is warm and comforting and all enveloping. I know I am dying my own death, and I welcome it.